JavaScript object notation, or JSON, is a really common data format used all over the world in different web services, IoT applications, many APIs, and lots of other places, including being a critical part of Node-RED. If you've never seen or worked with JSON before, it may seem a little daunting at first, but the structure is really easy to understand and get started with. And that's my goal for this video. I'll start by showing a generic example of just what JSON looks like and how it's structured and why it's structured that way. Then I'll show some real world examples and tools to help you get the most out of the format. Now, the first thing to know right off the bat is that JavaScript object notation data is stored as simply text. You can store it in a .txt file. And that is to say that it's a text representation of a JavaScript object. And that's why it has JavaScript in the name. But that doesn't mean that it's restricted to the JavaScript programming language. In fact, nearly every single modern programming language from Python to C and of course Node-RED has different ways of producing, consuming, and parsing JSON formatted data. Because it's really specifically structured, it's really easy for programs to work with JSON formatted data. But that consistent structure also makes it really easy for humans to read it as well. And we'll start with a nice generic example to show you what I mean by that. The first thing I need to do is define where my object starts and ends. And so I do that with an opening curly brace and a closing curly brace. And that's it. I've already got a JavaScript object notation data right here. It's just an object that happens to be empty. And something else you should know is I am going to be spacing out my data here a little bit so that you can see everything layered nicely. But there isn't actually any white space in JavaScript formatted data. We'll see an example of that later on. To make this a little bit more readable, let's space these brackets out and actually start putting some data in here. I'm going to put my notes in red, but the data is going to stay in black so that you can keep track. So my first thing I want to note is that each property exists as a name and value pair, where the name is always a string and the value can be one of many things. So let's see an example of that. I'll start by dropping my bracket down and we'll fill this object in with some more properties. The first property I'm going to call company and it's just going to have that name on the left the name of this property is company and it's always going to be a string the name always is a string but the value could itself also be a string and this pair makes up one property so when I have a name and a value I know that I have some property and it always exists with a name on the left which is a string and then some value on the right so there we go now I've got one property inside of this object so if I refer to the company of this object, I would get back the value opto. But what if I want to have more properties or I want to have properties that aren't strings? Well, the first thing I need to do is add a comma after my first property. You never have a comma at the end of all your properties, only in between them. So let's add another one here. This one I'll also give a, a string name. And this one is called count. And it has the value 22. And this time, instead of it being quote 22 and quote, it's just the number 22. And both me and any computer programs I send this to are able to differentiate the fact that it's a number and not a string because it doesn't have quotes around it. So now we have two different properties in here. Let's add some more and see what other data types we can have here. What other forms can the value take? Again, we'll have to have a comma after our number 22, and we'll have a value called open. The name of this one is quote open and quote. And it's going to have the value true. And this is a Boolean, so it can either be true or false. And again, we could have the string quote true end quote but this way without the quotes around it both me and any computer programs know that it's this boolean value it's either true or false this is really useful for things like discrete inputs and outputs because they can just have one of two states true or false on or off but what happens if you have some kind of reading let's add another property in here that's just called reading but i don't know what the measurement is I can't just put in zero if I don't know it because it could be a measurement of say zero degrees or zero gallons. I can't put false because that means that it's off. I need some way of saying, hey look, I have a reading but I don't actually know what it is. So we have a special word for that and it's null. Again, this exists without quotes. It's a special one kind of like booleans and numbers. And this just says we don't know what it is. It's not that it's zero, it's that we don't have a value for it. There's no value for this particular reading. So these are the main types we can have for our values. Strings, numbers, booleans, and then this sort of special null, no value representation. But what if I want to store more than one value for some particular property? Let's have a look at that now. I'll again add another comma after my null, and I'm going to add a list. 
And a list lets me store multiple values. So in this case, I have three strings, but I could also have an array or list of numbers or a list of booleans, or I could have a list just saying null. But these are inside of square brackets, not inside of curly brackets. And that's how we know that it's an ordered list, this array. But instead of having some name to refer to each of these uh, people by, I instead refer to them by their number as they appear in the ordered list. So item zero is going to give me Benson, item one will give me Bob, and item two will give me Ben. And we'll see how to actually refer to this a little bit later on. The final type I can have is actually an object in itself. So let's say I want to store the address for this company. I of course have to have a comma at the end of my list, I'll put my address in, and then I'm going to define a new object within my main object here, and it's going to contain different properties that are going to represent parts of the address. I could have it just as one long string, but I want to break it down separately. So inside of this value, it's, which itself is an object, I'm going to have a street property that's going to be business park drive. Then I can put a comma in and have another property here that's got the name code, and that can be 92590. And each of these sub properties are themselves name value pairs, and I can refer to them by moving my way through the object. So let's have a look at what that um, might look like. We'll start with this outside object. You can see the two curly brackets on the left to find my main object. You can see within that I have an address object. So to refer to that address object, I do a dot address. And then finally, I want to get that sub property dot code. So I go from the object, my main object here, to dot address property to the sub property dot code, and that will resolve to my 92590. So it's really easy for me to break down these different layers and get the specific data I want. Let's have a look at a real world example. Here, I've got some data from the Open Weather Map API. And you can see, like I said before, there's actually no white space in here. It's all just raw text. But we can easily break it down to make sense of it. We've got a coord object here, and that has itself an, is an object with two values inside of it. One's called long for longitude, and one's called lat for latitude, and they have uh, different floating point values to them. Then I have another weather property here, and that happens to be an array that contains a description of the current weather conditions. You can see just by identifying where each of the brackets and commas are, it's really easy to break down the data just by glancing at it like this. But what's cool about JavaScript object notation is it's really easy to force it to print it out a little bit prettier, and we refer to that as pretty print. Here, I have an extension for my browser that does that for me automatically. You can see here I have my coordinates breaking down nicely into this object, and I can collapse that. Here's my weather array with my data inside of it, my main information about the current temperature, and so on. We have all this different data really nicely broken down into this easily readable pretty format. So we can see that it's nice and easy to grab our data, but what if we want to grab something specific like, for example, the light rain description or just the current temperature? Let's take a look at an example in Node Red. We'll be bringing the same data into a nice simple flow. If you don't know how to work with this, we do have another video that covers the Open Weather Map API in depth. We'll have that linked in the description below. Let's start by just viewing this raw data. If I select this, you can see here I'm able to return a parse JSON object automatically out of this HTTP request node. Or I can also grab it as just a UTF-8 string. Let's have a look at that in this first example. I'll deploy my changes to the flow, inject, and you'll see here on the right in the debug pane, I get that raw text. If I didn't have some way of automatically parsing it with the node, that's no problem. I can just come down to these parsers and drag in a JSON parsing node. You can see by the description of this, it's able to turn a JSON string into its JavaScript object not notation and the other way around. For now though, I'll just use the built-in one with the HTTP request node. So I'll make sure I return a parse JSON object, deploy, and we'll view that nicely formatted data as it's broken down by node red in the right here. Now we can see that I have my coord object and that has my latitude and longitude. My weather is an array with that one index of zero in there, and that holds these different pieces of information. Now you can see it's saying scattered clouds, and we have our different main temperature information here, and some stuff under system, like our sunrise and sunset time. All of this data is really nicely broken down, as you can see here, once it actually parses the JSON. Now let's pick out a specific value. Let's say I just want to see the city name Temecula. So that'll be under message.payload. That's the name of the main object that Node Red hands around, and that's what is produced by this HTTP request node. And we want to get the property name, which is going to give me this string value, Temecula. 
If I don't know how to drill down to that, it's fine. I can just use this third button on the left here, and it'll copy the path to this particular property to my clipboard. Now I can view just that specific property. Let's make a copy of our debug node here and put in the specific property. Instead of message.payload, I'll paste this in, and we'll see we'll go to message.payload.name. Let's have a look at just that one specific property, and we should expect to see the value to Macula. Now I'll deploy, inject here on the left, it'll grab at that specific property, and there we go. You can see that this node is just grabbing the string Temecula outside of this larger object. But what if we want to go one deeper? For example, under chord, we could get the latitude and the longitude. Let's grab the latitude for now. I'll again use that link over here on the right, select that, and paste that into my debug node. You can see here it's still going under message.payload. Then we go under the property coord, which itself is an object, and we grab the specific sub-property latitude. So let's have a look at that now. I'll deploy and inject all my debug, and here we go. We can see I've extracted that latitude as its one sub-property deeper. You can also see that it's identified this as a number because it doesn't have quotes around it, whereas Temecula is red with the quotes around it, so we can immediately see the data type. Let's grab one more example inside of this weather array. I want to go into the weather array, go into this first index of zero, and grab this description scattered clouds. Again, to make it easier, I'll just copy this path to my clipboard, and I'll paste that into my debug node. Here you can see I'm going to message.payload, then I go under weather, and instead of doing dot zero, I use the same square brackets to identify which specific index I want to do. So because I defined it with the square brackets that you saw earlier, you can see those right here, we also use those square brackets to identify we want this zero with item. Let's have a look at that now. We're going to go into this item and grab this description scattered clouds and display that in the debug pane. Let's go ahead and click deploy, inject, and we can see, there we go. I'm going to this zeroth item of this weather array and grabbing the description for that particular object. It's really easy to see how these items are broken down just by following the nice generic example that I started with. You've got all the different data types that you could ever need, for example, strings, numbers, booleans, and then finally that special null value. You can also store lists and sub-objects within objects that are uh, larger and containing it. You can break this down as deep as you need to, to get multiple layers of, of data so that you can have a really specific structure for whatever you need, whether it's weather, whether it's some kind of industrial control, or just API data from any different source you could imagine. If you have any questions, check out the Node-RED forms or our Opto forms that we'll have linked in the description below. Thanks for watching.